Good afternoon. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about transmissions. So we've already talked about ratios and the specking aspects, but we haven't really talked about... So we're going to discuss gearing, screws, and linkages. And this will probably be the only lecture we focus on the actual mechanics or building of transmissions. Homework two is due now. Homework three I'll post later today. Um, and then all of your nylon SLS parts will be ready tomorrow. Alyssa sent me, this is kind of neat, but she sent me the image of the build layout for the, all the parts that were printed. And this is inside that giant fuse printer. It's a canister about kind of like this big, and it's filled with all the parts. <laughs> So everyone will end up getting, so this is for the groups that printed here, I think there are eight or nine of you. Um, everyone will get four mounts. So you'll have one spare, and that's good practice. If you guys can ever kind of create ahead of time, especially when this process is extremely like, labor intensive to get it, get it going, it's good to get yourself an extra just in case. Um, and there was one group who missed the deadline to get it printed through SLS. I forget which group that was, but there, you guys, okay. I, I'm gonna, she said just to send her an email, and then I'm just printing like the regular um, Ender ones, like for the next, for tomorrow. Okay. And, <laughs> and you're, gonna re, you're gonna actually get them out of this. Yeah. That is, okay. So one thing, so these are gonna be um, awesome parts, I think. Um, the, the SLA printers that we have, like I'm kind of interested to see, see the parts. So if anybody wants to print an extra part or wants to print a second set of mounts, it'd be cool to see like what the SLA printers will do. Also form labs printers, there's a bunch of them in that room. It'll be just kind of neat to see what those parts are. Those are the ones that are gonna eventually kind of get more brittle. So they might, it might not be a good fit, but it would be cool to see. So I'm, I'm interested in that. If anybody's gonna print some more mounts, it'd be cool to print out of that. But this is really neat, this is hilarious. Alyssa, I think had a good time. Yeah. So, so what ends up happening here is it's kind of rolling out this this thin layer of this nylon, then it burns it with a laser, it's and it turns into a to a part, it fuses together, and then it keeps doing that. So it rolls a little bit more, burns it, drops it down. So this ends up becoming filled with nylon that's either sintered or powder. So then after this, Alyssa will go in and remove all of the extra powder, separate all the parts clean them up and give them to you. So that's what's kind of happening today. So this went the entire weekend. We started on Friday. She set up the print by like 1 p.m. And it went all the way until I think yesterday morning. And then yesterday and today, she's gonna do the post-processing. Yeah. Can that powder get reused or anything? Or is it just trash? I don't know, that's a good question. I think it probably can be reused. That would be my guess. But it's a lot of, you know, it's any empty volume. It's gonna be a lot of powder. So that's and if you look next to this printer, there's like a station with a hood on it. That's for getting out all the residual powder. If you look next to this giant printer in the maker space. So this will be cool, it'll be fun to see. Um, also kind of, it'll be cool to see adding the inserts to the nylon, how different that is from the FDM version we did in class. So, okay, that'll be great. Lab six, I think it's lab six actually, is tomorrow. The goal for this lab is to assemble your ball bot. So you, at this time, at least by like the beginning of lab tomorrow, you should have all your parts. And now we're gonna do is put them all together and wire them. So we'll create some information to describe wiring. The wiring is, in this case is all plugging in connectors, so there's no soldering off to do, at least not yet. If we get to using potentially some of the lights, we might end up doing some soldering. But you should end up with something that looks like this. Your ball should be inflated. So this, you know, at the end of the day tomorrow, you should have something that is a ball bot that will fall off your basketball. <laughs> cool. OK, also, Professor Chad Jenkins, who's an undergraduate um, kind of lead for robotics, he's going to stop by. I think he's interested to see how you guys are doing, uh, see kind of where your ball bots are. So he might stop by tomorrow. I told him it would be probably better if he came at the end of class. Just because you guys will be, by that time, there will be some ball bots assembled, I suspect. So that'll be fun. And then also COE photography might stop by as well. I think they're kind of interested in this class and kind of tracking it. So she, her name is Brenda, she'll likely stop by tomorrow to take photos of you guys doing your thing. If there's any issue with that or you don't want to have your picture taken, just let me know. Um, and then it's also possible that she comes to class a few times, takes pictures of us in here. 
Um, I think the uh, college is kind of excited about all the robotic stuff going on. So does anybody like know that they are uneasy about having their picture taken or that doesn't sound like something they want to be a part of? Okay. Okay, great. That makes it easy. But if you feel that way, that would be okay. Just let me know. So that's lab tomorrow. Assembly. Does anybody feel like they won't be ready to have their ball bot assembled by the end of the day tomorrow? <laughs> okay. Can we're like laser cutting still a little bit more during the lab? You can laser cut. Yeah, some tomorrow. And the laser cutting's fast. I think, it would be, I think you could laser cut your plates, all of them tomorrow, and still assemble. Because suddenly, if you know what you're doing, will probably take like a half hour. We'll have, we have kind of like fasteners there in, we'll show this tomorrow, but a little, a little like drawer thing that contains all the fasteners you need. So you guys will just get the fasteners as you need them. We're not going to dole them out, but you guys will have access to all the fasteners. Cool. That's going to be fun. All right. So this is kind of the end of our, I'm going to review just a tiny bit of our manufacturing stuff that we learned last time. Um, so we have done our specking analysis. We're about to head to layout and transmissions. And we talk about additive manufacturing, laser cutting, and water jet cutting. Um, we kind of skipped to manufacturing because you guys were gearing up to do that for your ball bots. We talked about kind of the, the best practices for water jet cutting. We talked about tabbing text, uh, including nut spaces for nuts, to, uh, creating fasteners, eat more easily and it's more convenient to assemble and disassemble. Um, we had a cool little demo. We showed you a couple water jet parts that we created. This was for tabbing large sections of parts. So you guys, if you're cutting, you might be making many small parts. They're gonna fall into a water jet's water bath, so tabbing is an easy way to get around that. Um, you can do that either manually in SolidWorks, like we did in that example, where you were editing the sketch and adding your own little tabs or the program itself that does the cutting can add them for you. That, that program is Protomax Layout. And as a reminder, the water jet is down, still in FRB. And all you guys know when it's back up. And this is how it creates tabs automatically for you. It has a few different settings, but it's pretty straightforward. It's, we usually do kind of tabs that are between one and three millimeters. So what you would end up doing is breaking that tab and sanding it down to get rid of it just like a plastic sort of model part. We talked a little bit about best practices and flexure design. Um, and if we're cutting metal and making flexures, that's really close to making springs, which is, could be a whole class in itself. Um, but I gave you kind of one example from our research where we're making planar springs that are cut from a wire EM in our case, which is just a higher precision version of a wire jet in a sense. It cuts really, really, really fine, so there's almost no curve. Um, kind of like six to 20 microns of curve, so it's very, very low. It makes parts that if you put them together, you can't visually see that they're two separate parts. Um, but I suspect that these can be cut on a water jet also, which would kind of make it cheaper and easier to make. We've done kind of some math that goes into the characterization of flexures like these. I can share that with you at some point if you guys are interested. But that's just kind of an example. This is putting all of the math together that says the deflection of these springs is a function of its geometry, material properties, length of its individual radial flexures, et cetera. But there's a whole lot you can do with metal flexures. We're not going to really cover it in this class, but it gives you a lot of, of power as a designer. Anybody know, like, what springs can be used for in robotics. There's a couple, there's two like main uses. Have you ever seen this? elastic elements used in robotic systems? One option, do you, anybody want to throw a, a guess out there? Yeah. Dampening. Um, I would say like the, so that would be like more of a loss, you're saying there's loss associated with it. Ideally, springs have a very low loss, but energy storage would probably be the spring analog of what you're saying. And that's a, that's a huge advantage. In fact, the reason that springs often come up in robotics is because they store and return energy. It makes things more efficient. Um, there's two uses. One is a parallel elastic mechanism, so where you use a spring to provide some of the output torque. So maybe you have a spring in parallel with your motor, 
Now the motor doesn't have to do all of that torque. The spring can do some of it, and the motor can supplement. So you can kind of use springs to change what the motor has to do. Outside the scope of this class, but just something to know. The other option in robotics is to put a spring between the output of the transmission and the load. So, so the, the load, the, if you're interacting with this robot, you're actually interacting with a spring first. So a spring is the first thing that you would interact with, then there'd be the transmission and motor. And then what you could do is sense the deflection of that spring very easily using position sensors. If you can sense the deflection of that spring, you know how much force or torque it's applying. So it is used to create really high fidelity torque systems or force systems because you can sense the deflection of a spring really easily, whereas otherwise sensing torque or force kind of can be challenging or expensive or heavy. So those are just two kind of cool uses of, of elastic mechanisms that can be cut with a water jet, often used in robotics. Not so much for rapid prototyping, which is why we're like not really learning that in this class because it's a little more sophisticated. Yeah. Aren't there like a bunch of in an IMU like mini springs that are like used to like can, like I forget like whatever yeah. the linear acceleration or the gyroscope or whatever. Yeah. Or, like, they are. They're like tiny, tiny elastic elements that the deflection is sensed. Well, we will actually learn IMUs uh, in a lecture or two. But yeah, that's right. Cool. Um, we did this in-class example, and you guys did really good. In fact, somebody's, this is somebody's file. I forget which one. Some, one of you sent me their file, and I used it for this. So mine was not as completed as yours, but it looks great. Um, we did this example, and that kind of gave you practice tabbing, editing sketches. Um, and then it gave you this file, which you can now use if you want. So like you could, for example, cut that into your, into your acrylic plates. So that was neat. I thought that was like a good combination, water jet and prep slash useful sketch. Oh, you guys are really good with that. I was impressed. So this kind of brings us to where we are now. So we've done specking. We've done 3D modeling, design, file generation, preparing for manufacturing. What might be preparing for manufacturing? What do you think I mean by, it? so in 3D modeling, we've done 3D design in SOLIDWORKS, we've done file generation, DXFs, et cetera, and prep for manufacturing. You might think like, what, what might be included in that? Yeah. Like all like the tolerancing and best practices. Tolerancing and best practices. So you might, okay, once you have your file generation or your solid model, you might end up going in there and modifying them after the fact to add spacing for motion or other things. Yep. We've learned manufacturing, additive manufacturing, laser, laser cutting, water jetting. So we skipped a part about like layout and transmissions. And we skipped that to get to the uh, modeling and manufacturing side for lab. But now we're going to go back through it. We're going to spend one lecture today on transmission styles. OK, and the way I think we're going to kind of motivate this is that Transmissions and layouts and this stage of a robot design is really moving motion from one place to another. So now we're talking about layout and transmissions. And robots were often moving motion from the actuator or motor to the end effector. So if you're building your robot or designing it in this sense, like you now know, you know your actuator, you know your motor, you know your tra desired transmission ratio, but you got to get that motion from where the motor is to where the output is. And that can, that can be a part of this layout and transmission process. And it begins with understanding the geometry of your robot and transmission. So this is actually like extremely application specific. So it's kind of hard even to talk about this, the layout side, because often like you're building a robot to perform a task and that's gonna have constraints on what it looks like, how big it is or small it is. So like, it's hard to teach that generally. So what we're going to do is introduce transmissions today. 
Transmissions, linkages. And then we're going to do an in-depth example of ball bot geometry. That's going to come up next lecture, I think, depending on how far we get today. We're going to do an in-depth example of the ball bot geometry. For example, when we gave you that motor mount file, it had some planes and fasteners that we said don't move. That comes from this style of analysis. Like we knew the geometry of the system. We provided that to you. So we're going to go through that together. And then we're going to move to mechatronics. Then we're going to do IMUs, like sensors, communication. And after that, we'll do dynamics and control. And that will probably, like, that'll be the rest of the class, I suspect. OK, so understanding motion, determined layout. We need to understand the required motion of our robot design. In our case, we're moving motion from a motor to a set of wheels. Um, motion can be rotational, I guess, which is maybe more common, or linear. Actually, I'll call this. It's less common, but it's also like more challenging. So rotary to rotary systems, that is what we're doing. Not, so not as difficult. Rotary to linear, more challenging. You have to handle like linear motion, which usually includes like guides and other sorts of things that makes it more challenging. So then we also need to package our ratio in the proper form factor. So you're going to have some constraints on what the system is supposed to look like. That's going to come into this. There's many types of transmissions. We're going to discuss gearing, belt drives, which I actually we're not going to discuss, but I kind of want to, but I don't know if it's worth the time. We're going to discuss screws and linkages. So we're really actually like. We're not really going to discuss belt drives, unless we end up with some extra time. This lecture is going to step through these. And I think I referenced this lecture kind of earlier in the class. OK. Often there are geometric constraints in addition to ratio constraints. Does motion need to be somewhere specific? And the answer to that is yes. All bot. Yeah. What does the first bullet point say about belt drives? Gearing. Thank you. So let's step through sort of geared gear design. Design and geared transmissions. So First, obtain any geometric information. That's going to keep coming up because it's it is sort of what usually drives this. For the ball bot, we had our location of the wheels. In other systems, you might have you, know, you might be moving an end effector around. You might have constraints on where that has to be. Your volume, workspace volume. Deep dive next lecture. And before you design a linkage or gear transmission or set of screws, you have to have some information first. And I kind of want to talk through that. You need to know things like your range of motion. Or workspace. Can you know like how much space or how many degrees or radians does the system have to travel through? Maybe it's continuous operation, maybe it's not. For example, the systems we build that, that mirror sort of biological or human systems 
don't do mm -hmm. continuous motion, and they certainly don't do more than one revolution. So you have workspace constraints or range of motion constraints, geometry of your system, torque and loading information, ratio and efficiency, and lastly, like your desired convenience. <coughs> How easy do you want this to be? Like, how you, you know, how can you, how do you want to trade convenience for robustness? And that's kind of a personal decision. We often, in my group, don't typically opt for con maybe convenience is the wrong word, but we typically spend a little more time on the refining side. So our prototypes that we build are a little more refined than what would be considered sort of typical rapid prototyping. But that's a decision we've made. So if we make that ahead of time, we're not going to wrap the prototype this. We're going to spend a little more time and have a more kind of polished design. Systems can be back drivable. I kind of want to introduce that first. I think you guys are all familiar with back driving. Power going backwards through the transmission. You're driving the motor through the output. It would be acting as a generator in that case. Some transmissions can back drive, some cannot. So back drivable and non back drivable, whether negative power can be transmitted through the transmission. Some transmissions have this property. It's related to efficiency. That sort of makes sense. The less efficient it is, the harder it will be to back drive. But it's also related to other concepts like pressure angle. Just kind of a line of action and the force through the, through the transmission. Friction cones. There are some transmissions that cannot back drive kind of by the nature of their physics. If you apply more torque, if you're operating in a friction cone, it will provide more resistance. It just doesn't go anywhere. It's a physical property. So that would have implications in what's the what is the downstream effect of no or no back driving or a downstream effect? So if you want your system to do positive work, go through some positive power trajectory, that's forward driving. Then if it's going to do negative power, it means the output's going to drive the motor. That's back driving. If it can't back drive, it can't do that. So if you can't regenerate any energy, it won't operate in negative power. It'll just lock. I'm going to say no energy regeneration. Energy re regeneration is when the motor is acting like a generator and powering the battery. Does that make sense? I didn't talk about that specifically, but I kind of it's sort of an extension of everything we've learned. Okay. So these transmissions will have characteristics about back driving. There are three kind of types of gearing we're going to discuss. Spur gears, which is our top example. So spur gears are your classical gears. Two gears made with straight teeth, input drive and the output. Which one is the input? And which one's the output? Yeah. Small gear is the input. Correct. How'd you know that? Um, it, I just know it drives the bigger gear. That's true. <laughs> it does drive the bigger gear. Well, the reason we want the small gear to be the input is we want usually the you know the motor needs to go faster than the output. So we want to decrease its speed. So we want to have that one be the lower diameter gear, and then we also want to increase its torque. So we want the larger gear on the output, that larger radius will give us more torque. Yeah. Isn't that not always the case though? Like sometimes you would want to speed up? It's not always, yeah, it's not always the case that this is true. If you're using motors, electric motors, it's generally always the case. But there are our systems, it kind of depends on the operating kind of power and efficiency of, of the power source. So if it's an electric motor, they generally run really fast. You might have an application where you want to speed it up. Like I think you know, the, we used an example the other day about 
overdrive gearing in a car. It's an example where the <laughs> ratio inverts, but it's it's pretty unusual. Like certainly in rapid prototyping. What if you're making like a ball shooter or something like that? Like wouldn't you, would you still be decreasing because the motor would be fast enough? Or if you're making like a wiffle ball shooter or a baseball, like a baseball pitcher? Almost always. I mean, if it's electrically driven, it would almost always like have a transmission that's going to improve the torque decrease speed. Because the motor, I mean, unless you're, like it kind of depends on the geometry, but generally motors move much faster than things we want to move around in this world. Um, okay, good. You got the input and output. That's great. Bevel gearing looks like this. So bevel gearing is the same concept as spur gears, but they're rotated 90 degrees. So there's a 90 degree change in motion here. Motion from this axis transmits to this axis. We won't necessarily go through too much on bevel gearing specifically on their design but you should know they exist and you can buy them as a, as a set. Worms and worm gears, that's something that looks like this. Similarly, we're rotating the, uh, the motion by 90 degrees. And worms and worm gears have extremely high ratios. We'll talk about, about that in a bit. You're not going to have to know like, this level of the anatomy, but I wanted to show it. We're going to talk about gearing is essentially based on a, a circle called the pitch circle or pitch diameter. It's this guy. The pitch diameter, that's the diameter of that circle, is theoretical. Diameter or circle. on which all calculations are based. So it's about midway through the tooth. And this is the, the diameter that we use when we're talking about our radii. It's the diameter that comes up uh, in all of our calculations called the pitch diameter or pitch circle. The diametric, diametral pitch, that's just the ratio of the number of teeth to the pitch diameter. This is in teeth per millimeter, or teeth per meter. Backlash. Backlash is going to be, we talked about this maybe once before, but it's going to be rotation of the input without rotation of the output. We'll say amount of angular play in transmission. It can come from a few different things, but what's common here, at least in the design of gears, is that the spacing between the teeth is larger than the space of the tooth. So that creates a tiny bit of backlash. And they're usually, it's usually pretty small. Small gear in these transmissions is known as the pinion, and the large is known as the gear. So we have a pinion that drives the gear. Let's talk through some equations. These equations here. Take individual gear, so this is describing the diametral pitch and the circular pitch. And the pinion teeth, so I'm just going to quickly do these. Number of teeth on pinion, gear teeth, number of teeth on gear. Transition ratio, you guys know this, but ratio of input and output. Input, output, speed, torque, diameter, that is bad. Better. 
And then conjugate action is just the word, the word we use to describe a relative motion between the gears. And it says, it defines that the ratio of velocity is inversely proportional to the pitch radii. So this is kind of where we're getting this set of expressions. Our transmission ratio n, it's going to be our ratio of the pinion diameter, pitch diameter of the pinion gear, the pitch diameter of the gear, or the number of teeth on the pinion, or the number of teeth on the gear, or the inverse of their velocity uh, ratios or their torque. They're all kind of defined the same way. I think you guys are good with this. So there's not, I mean, if we're developing gearing, so really the thing that matters is its spacing, like pitch diameter. And you can buy, you want to be able to buy transmissions like this that are built already for you, or you sometimes make them yourself, where you would specify gears and set them apart and mount them to shafts. If we wanted to just buy them, Especially for rapid prototyping, it's easy to buy them. So you can buy them with a motor. This is known as a gear motor. So a motor and a gear head together are called a gear motor. You can this is the one that you are you guys are using in your ball bot, but you can buy them together. So this, if we were kind of thinking about building a ball bot and specking a ratio. And implementing it, this makes this really easy. So we don't have to do a lot of the difficult layout and creation of a transmission. You can just buy it attached to your motor. Then all we have to do is space everything correctly when we create our ball bot. Multiple ratios are available for a given motor. This is convenient. So this just means everything is already selected for you, so you don't have to do any of the selection of those gears, the number of teeth, you can just buy it off the shelf. One option is two gears, two spur gears next to each other. Another option is what's called a rack and pinion. We're going to think of this as a spur gear set with an infinite what? So we have a gear here. This gear is meshing with something called a rack, which is really a line of gear teeth. If we wanted to think about that in terms of spur gears and our understanding of spur gears, what's going on with this gear? It has an infinite what? Yeah. Infinite diameter. And what diameter? Or like what diameter would we? It's like the, the gear, infinite gear diameter? Yeah, or, or I'm trying to get to pitch diameter, which is a, what all the things you were saying are also true. But I'm going to say it's an infinite pitch diameter. You guys thinking about working in the, in the pitch diameter or pitch circle space. So this is going to translate rotary motion to linear motion. So now if we wanted to use that in a rotation to rotational system, we have to convert it back. So mostly these are only generally only used when you really want linear motion. Anybody know any examples of where rack and pinions exist? Yeah. The 3D printers have those. 3D printers have screws and belt drives. They might also have rack and pinions somewhere. So that definitely could also be true. Yeah. Car steering? Car steering is a common one. Or like a older, older school method of car steering. But when you turn your steering wheel inside, there's this rack that's moving the wheels side to side. Okay, and that can be generally like plastic, brass, or steels. 
this doesn't, like bracket opinions don't come up too much, but they're good to know. This here is the line of action or line of contact. So the force that's being transmitted from the pinion here to the rack goes through that angle, and that angle is defined by the shape of that gear tooth, and there's a lot that goes into shaping gear teeth. We're not going to learn about that. But know that this concept and that line of action is really carefully created in the shaping of those teeth. There's a special word we use to describe the shape of gear teeth. Does anybody know what that is? It's a type of profile. Yeah, I think at least the mechanical engineers have probably heard it. It's an involute profile. The shape. An involute profile comes from if I have a, like a circle, and I have a string around that circle, and I hold that string at one point and rotate it up, and it maintains taut and tangent to that circle, the shape, the curve made by my fingers would be an involute profile. It's just how those teeth are developed. These are the equations that govern, we're going to now talk about worm gearing. These equations govern worm gearing, and worm gears are used for extremely high ratios. So a worm gear is basically this gear here. It's turning. We're just going to also rotate the worm gear. So this is actually this thing is called worm gear, or sometimes called worm wheel. This is the worm. It's defined by its axial pitch, which you could also think of as its lead. That is the linear distance between the teeth or its angle, alpha. The transverse circular pitch is a, is a concept that comes up if we're thinking about uh, understanding the different equations here. The transverse circular pitch of PT is defined by kind of taking, um, we're going to end up dividing by cosine of this angle alpha. Backlash for worm gears is, is less noticeable. Anybody know like why that might be true? Why a backlash might be less noticeable in worm gears? Yeah. There's more gears actually in the slots. Something like this. Slots are more exact. I think that that property would be the same for spur gears compared to worm gears. It's because the ratios are generally like extremely high. Has anybody been to the MIT Museum in Cambridge? They have like a, a exhibit there, like a piece of art, or I don't know what it is, but it's a bunch of compound worm gear transmissions. And you can run the out, like output of this as much as you want. It goes through a bunch of worm gears, and it goes straight into a concrete block. And so no matter how much you move this, the input doesn't move at all, ever, because the ratios are so high. And if we create compound gear trains, it might have a ratio in like the thousands or tens of thousands. It's kind of neat. Backlash is less noticeable because of the high ratio. And it rotates angular motion. Worm gears are generally non, not backdrivable. A lot of the efficiency and backdrivability of worm gears depends on that angle alpha. The closer that angle is to zero, the, hard, the less efficient and harder to backdrive it is. So we've learned a little bit about gearing, the relevant equations, relevant concepts and geometries, the pitch diameter and other factors. Um, talked about racks and pinion and worm gearing. 
Now we're going to move on to screws. Screws are actually really, really, really cool. I've used these a lot. Um, if I were taking rotary and converting to linear motion, I would generally use a screw rather than something like a crochet or vacuum tubing. How many of you guys have, are familiar with like lead screws and ball screws? Cool. Okay, yeah. great. So screws convert. Rotary motion into linear motion. Useful in a wide array of robotic systems. They're really, really useful. Lead screws, we're going to talk mostly about lead screws because if you're rapid prototyping, that's probably what you would use. Lead screws are low cost and useful. This is a lead screw. It is a screw. It has a nut called a lead nut. It has an angular motion of the screw and a torque applied. It's characterized by its lead. So the lead is the linear space around one rotation. So on the threads around one rotation. And then the lead nut will move. We're going to say that's motion of x and some force that's being applied. Fa, axial force. If we want to convert these properties into the torque or force, go back and forth, we use this equation. So this is what converts the torque applied on the screw to the force applied on the nut. So that's this is key. Lead screws can be purchased as a set. So you can buy a lead screw and a lead nut together. It's generally how they work. Actually have one here, I'm gonna pass it around. So this is one that we bought, I think we were just messing around with this one. Um, it's really, really nice. Actually, it's, this was extremely cheap. I think we got this on Masumi or McMaster. I think it was a nylon nut and a steel um, screw. And I want you just to kind of like spin it. You, yeah, I think it's, it is efficient enough that its own mass will back drive it. So like, this is pretty neat. It only does it down there. So check this thing out. There's something different about this than the one than what I'm talking to you about. Different about the kind of setup of this or its geometry. If you guys can figure it out, I'll be very impressed. But just kind of mess with this thing. It's really neat. You can also like unthread it. Then you can just throw it back in. Yeah, that makes it really cool. So that is a lead screw. So if somebody like is messing with this as you pass it around and you think you know what is different about that, there's probably lots of things different. Let me see if I can give you like a piece of information that kind of cues you in. It's about its geometry. It's a difference in its geometry. Okay. So pass that thing around is really neat. <coughs> we can buy them as a set. They, they look just like this. Um, and if we wanted to know the transmission ratio, do you think we can calculate it in a sensical way? If we do, it's going to be something that goes from rotary to linear. So that transmission ratio won't look like a regular transmission ratio because it's mixing linear and rotary. So I'm going to say <coughs> more information is needed to understand the ratio. If, oftentimes, that would be, if we were using that and we were still doing rotary to rotary, then we'd still be able to get a transmission ratio of the whole system. But it's hard to think about linear rotary to linear systems in terms of a transmission ratio. Ball screws can be used for highly efficient motion, screw-like motion. So here's a lead screw. It's like a general, it follows like the same threading that you would see, it's like general Acme <laughs> tooth profile, like it's just generally, it is just a screw. A ball screw is different. 
what it has is a set of internal ball bearings, and those ball bearings spin as the nut is rotated, and they travel through not only around the screw, but through like a return path. It's kind of hard to see. Um, kind of hard to see in this, but there's two tubes. There's two tubes right here and right here. So what's happening is as the screw is spinning, the balls are running around this, the screw, and then they're traveling through that tube back up to the top, and they roll down back up to the top. This one has two different returns for balls. What does this allow for? Or like, what's the difference between this setup and this setup? What does it allow, or what does it have? What kind of motion does it have? Or contact? Are you not able to back drive it? Or? A ball screw? Yeah. A ball screw you can have, or is actually like generally one of the most back drivable transmissions. Um, what kind of contact is happening here? Yeah. Frictionless? Close, rolling contact. So we have rolling contact here. What kind of contact is happening here? Sliding contact. Sliding contact is going to be less efficient. Rolling contact, highly efficient. So ball screws are much, much more efficient operation because they allow for rolling contact of the balls around the screw. Which is why if you look at these threads, it doesn't look like a, a normal tooth profile. It looks like a half circle because that's the track that the balls are rolling in around the screw before it returns through the, through the return tube and starts over. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, it's pretty dumb. Like in terms of the balls, it serves the same purpose as, purpose as like a ball bearing? Exactly the same thing as a ball bearing. Exactly the same purpose. So, so looking would be like a bearing that uses sliding contact. And a ball bearing would be a bearing that uses rolling contact. So yeah, ball screws are excellent, but they're very expensive. And they're like highly like precision machine components. They are, they're really, really nice, but they're also like kind of loud. Um, anybody like have any idea about the geometry of this? Yeah. Is it that the channels, there's like a couple of channels, instead of it just being like one all the way down, there's like a couple going down. That's right. Nice job. It's not that, so you guys, sorry, everybody who didn't see it yet. <laughs> um, so it looks like, so this is a screw that has one thread that's spinning around that shaft. That screw has four to five threads that spin together. And it makes for a much higher what? Or like, what dimension does that change most like effectively? So it's on this screen. What? Somebody's saying it. The lead. Yeah. So like what if you use what's called multiple starts? So if you use multiple starts, then you actually have a lot larger available options for the lead. Because the lead can get really long. Because now <laughs> we're not, it's not necessary that the screw actually like make that uh, like one rotation and one linear change at once. It can do that like four to five threads at a time. So that's why it's really fast. So that's going to be a really fast lead screw. It also is like one of the reasons why it's very efficient because that angle is really, is really, that angle is really wide. Okay. So lead screws, ball screws, what we use to convert between them. You will have, um, you'll have a question on these, probably on your homework. Any questions about these? There are other factors that go into the selection of, for example, a screw, but it's outside the scope of this class. But if you were really designing it, you'd be looking at the stress inside the lead, the, the ball screw or lead screw. But we're not going to do that. In rapid prototyping, 
we're not typically analyzing things that much. Like you guys would say, like, okay, I want to take linear motion, I want to take rotary motion converted to linear. You might do some calculations on the loading to make sure your system can support it, but you probably wouldn't go through the same level of calculations that you would if you were designing a precision machine. Does that make sense? So like this class kind of splits. It's not a precision machine design class. It's really a rapid prototyping class. So in rapid prototyping, we're not going to go through all of the depth. But if you're interested in knowing kind of other factors that go into the selection, for example, stress, let me know. Yeah. What do CNC machines use for their, like for the converting angular to linear? I think, so for example, a 3D printer uses a belt drive and a lead, belt drive for XY, lead screw for vertical yeah, axis. What about like a CNC mill? I don't know. Oh, that's a good question. I so it probably has to be like even more precise than a 3D print. So if you're talking about a, a three-axis mill that has kind of the handles, those are screws. I don't think they're lead screws. Mm -hmm. I think they're just precision lead screws okay. in that case. Uh, Multi-axis CNC is all rotational. Good question. Awesome. I feel like... We should take a three minute break or something. This is kind of a dry lecture. We have one more major like section to do, and we have 30 minutes, which is I think enough time. So why don't we take a five minute break, everybody wake up, we're almost done, and then we'll come back to, we're gonna do linkages next. <coughs> Where's that screw? I don't think they got you. When you look at that, does the multiple starts concept mm -hmm. make sense? Now that now you look at it? Yeah. You can tell there's many threads in parallel. It's kind of cool. So if you guys were building random robots, I think you guys could likely implement a lead screw. I think that would be like very doable. And it kind of gives you like lots and lots of options for rotary to linear. Should we keep going? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's keep going. Um, okay, linkages. Linkages are also something that you guys might commonly see in rapid prototyping systems. So linkages are gonna take inputs, typically rotational, convert that to motion, either rotational or linear, and it's gonna do that through a set of bars or links that constrain the mechanics. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about. It's generally like, what is that structure for building a linkage? And what are the constraints that exist? So linkages are also like commonly used in robotic systems. They have many uses. Rotary to rotary. Rotary to linear. Something about them is not linear. You may know before I write it. I think you just have an aspect of them that's nonlinear. They have nonlinear transmission ratios. We're going to see where that comes from. So 
So like similarly, you're gonna need all of this information, especially geometric information about your system. And we're gonna, so this is all the same stuff that went into the design of gearing, except now we have nonlinearities to think about. So when a linkage is built, you already know it's gonna be nonlinear. So then the question is like, how can you scale the system to have the type of transmission ratio that you want, given that it's nonlinear? That might look like scaling the linkage such that a large fraction of the ratio is constant, but you'll always have these kind of nonlinear aspects. Here's a few different example types of linkages. Slider crank is super common, parallelogram four bar, we're gonna talk about that one a lot. Um, there's like a gazillion. If you, this is a link in the notes when I upload them. If you click on that link, it's gonna take you to a website that has a ton of linkage options that you can kind of configure and play and they'll move, kind of change their properties around. It's pretty cool. So four bar, there's just a ton of information on four bars. We're gonna learn a very small amount of them. The first step is to determining the input and output links. So perhaps you know, this is gonna be our input, L3, it's gonna be our output, L1. So we're gonna identify like we have an input and an output, and now we're gonna figure out how are they constrained by the shape of this <laughs> linkage. And then how could you choose the lengths of these, its parameters, such that you got a ratio that you wanted. <laughs> We're going to, in this kind of next few slides, determine the, the transmission ratio in kinematics, and it's a function of the starting configuration and link lengths. So everything is gonna be parameterized by the lengths of these links and these angles. That's the links and the angles, this original configuration, that sets up what it's gonna do. So all of that can be adjusted beforehand to change what it does. But once it's defined in this way, once it's defined as a set of link links and a position, it's fully defined. And we're gonna determine the kinematics and transmission ratio using geometry. And that's, this is like a little complicated. So again, L3 is our input, L1 is our output. We're gonna say L4 is grounded. Anybody know what this, what this system would do just by looking at it? So if L3 is our input, L1 is our output, what's it gonna do? It's gonna go like that, yes. Great. Remember the goal of this is to be able to select link lengths and start in configuration to achieve a specific transmission ratio or to achieve a specific set of input output mechanics. So we have to understand how the constraints of this system can be used to determine that transmission ratio. And that transmission ratio is gonna be a not very fun expression to calculate. Okay, so to solve a, a four bar, really all we're doing is doing the geometry of making the links follow in their respective arcs. We know that they have to follow those arcs. So what we're gonna do is a set of analyses that define that mathematically. This analysis is known as kinematic synthesis. So we're gonna quantify how input velocity scales output velocity. Let's look in vector form. A series, in order to understand the mechanics of a four bar, there's a set of constraints that exist. The next few slides introduce these constraints. The points with L3, L2, L1, 
a force grounded, point A, point B, point C. Theta, B, I think it might also be phi, the other phi. Um, a, we're going to define in vector form. This is the point location of A, the point location of B, and the point location of C. If I use these expressions, I can get a geometric constraint that looks like this. What is that? What are you looking at right there? <clears throat> Something you've seen a lot. Just not like not doesn't look like this normally. We're doing like this triangle. It's Pythagorean theorem. So we're doing the geometry. We know that this triangle, this has to satisfy Pythagorean theorem. That's one geometric constraint. That's the first one. That's just defined here. So we have a geometric constraint around Pythagorean theorem. Another set of constraints, also geometric. I'm going to call these the position equation constraints. What is this saying? <laughs> Anybody know? Let's see if you can like look at that and see. What is that telling us? B is equal to B. This should be saying, <laughs> what we're saying is the total length in the x direction has to be equal to the total, like it's kind of equating this length and this length. So it's kind of saying, it has to be, the links have to be connected to each other. So they all have to end and terminate kind of in the same locations. So that's set up for both the x-axis and the y-axis at once. This is the velocity constraint equations. This tells us how the velocities of these points move with respect to each other. So between all these equations, what we're end up ending up with is a bunch of constraints around the motion of this. And now we have to take that information, repackage it, and determine a ratio. Okay, so hopefully you're tracking, and like we're talking about linkages. Linkages have a bunch of constraints that make them work. Those constraints are, can be used to define or, or characterize their motion. And that's what we're doing. But their motion is not as simple as something like you know, other transmissions, like screws or gears, because it's nonlinear. Because there's a ton of sines and cosines in, the, in these expressions. And that is both challenging, because it means it's going to be nonlinear. It means you have to sort of handle that in your design process. But it also means there's a ton of flexibility with these mechanisms. And they can do all sorts of different things. There's a million different types. I actually have like a book called 501 Mechanisms or something. It's like a little coffee table book of all different types of mechanisms like this. Linkages, linkages combined with other things. It's really neat. Maybe I'll bring that in. But we're basically like using these constraints to determine the mechanics. And it's highly nonlinear. That is both a disadvantage, but could also be an advantage. Okay, only a few more slides. This is our expression for its transmission ratio. We'll talk more about that in two slides, but this kind of nasty expression describes its transmission ratio, which is also the ratio of their angular velocities, in the doubt, but that's what we're going to talk about next in two slides. We call this a kinematically varying <coughs> transmission ratio. 
So if you were trying to implement this, you might care about this transmission ratio function. So you can observe it and manipulate it by manipulating the, the shape of this four bar, both its starting configuration and its link lengths. So that will let you create that transmission ratio with some degree of ability to manipulate it. Singularities exist in four bars. And singularities can occur when two links are collinear. That's what's happening there. So when these links are collinear, the gray the yellow link, the system has reached a singularity. It's lost a degree of freedom. So it causes the instantaneous loss of a degree of freedom of the mechanism. Let's think about what that, what that means. So in this example, L3 was our input, L was our output, right? As it sits, can the input transmit torque to the output? No. Right now, it cannot transmit torque. Like any motion, like no, you know, if there's motion here, there's actually no motion there. Briefly, while it's in a singularity, it crosses a point where there's no motion applied. Cause the loss of a degree of freedom. The applied torque from L3 cannot So let's think, let's think about this for a second. I'm going to derive that in a second in the next slide. But let's think about this. P dot over theta dot, that's our transmission ratio, it's our instantaneous transmission ratio. Theta dot is going to change sign as that singularity, as it goes through that singularity. That's when it's doing, it's coming back. That's when its velocity goes to zero. The slope of the input output kinematics or ratio goes to infinity or zero. In robotics, you want to avoid singularities. So if you're ever building a mechanism with a linkage, you want to make sure it can never get into this position. We avoid singularities by 30 degrees or more. So don't, don't let it. So when you're designing this linkage, you're specifying the lengths of all these. We specify them such that you'll never be close to a singularity. Cool. <clears throat> okay. There's going to be, typically, when you're designing a linkage, there's going to be an infinite number of combinations of linkages that are viable. So there's many degrees of freedom in your linkage. You can change all your link lengths. Your starting configuration, that leads to many solutions. There are many combinations that are viable. That's common. They're going to have different average ratios. Ranges of motion. Distance to singularity. So these, these linkages will have kind of different attributes. 
And we're going to talk just a second about how like, maybe we went through this process designing a language in our research. Can we determine the ratio empirically? The answer to that is yes. And that's what I was trying to say before. So n is going to be u dot over theta dot, which could be d phi dt, dt, which equals d phi by d theta. So this is the transmission ratio is the slope of the input output kinematics. So now you have an, for a linkage, you have an expression that tells you the ratio in closed form with a bunch of sines and cosines. But you can also <coughs> build a linkage, let's say in MATLAB, build a linkage, characterize its motion, and then find its transmission ratio by taking the slope of that curve. So that's another way to determine it. This is the first generation version of our open source prosthetic leg we've talked about. It has a four bar linkage in it. The four bar linkage is like highlighted in blue. That is the like, third stage of that transmission. So there's two other stages that are belt drives ahead of it. You can kind of see them. And then a four bar linkage. Yeah. What's the benefit of building a four bar linkage and then measuring its properties? Wouldn't that be a little bit of a waste of time if let's say you're building something that you guess has these properties but you don't know for sure you might build it and it's not going to be right and then how are you going to design something that has the right properties without being able to measure the properties before you design before yeah, you make it for that it would be like let's say you found a full ride linkage and you wanted to know its properties or you had data and you want to know the ratio or something like that it wouldn't be in the design process um okay so full ride linkage we want this linkage to be as small and compact as possible. And we want it to have as much range of motion as possible. This plot is one of the ways that we did that. We looked at like thousands of combinations of four-bar linkages. This is range of motion. This is average transmission ratio. Each one of those circles is a potential for viable four-bar linkage. We make sort of this curve here, which is sort of a set of optimal four bar linkages depending on how you trade range of motion and average ratio. The one we ended up choosing is this yellow dot kind of right there. So this is kind of one way that we investigated our four bar linkages during its design process. There's another factor that really matters, but it's 100% practical. Anybody know like what's another, another factor that's gonna really come into play in this linkage, practical factor. Yeah. The space and the housing where the linkages can go. Yeah, that's true. This what I'm trying to get at is the size of that top link. It's really short, right? So practically, there's going to be a, a distance there that's not going to be feasible from a kind of packaging standpoint. So we had to kind of choose a viable distance there. So we'll say it's something like a centimeter, or maybe 15 millimeters. And then that defines the rest of the size of the system. And we couldn't really go much lower than that. We didn't feel like it was prudent. So that's going to make it really sensitive to, for example, tolerancing issues in that link length. The smaller it is, the more sensitive it will be to those types of errors. So we kind of felt like that's about as small as we're willing to go. That scales the rest of the linkage. This is an example of our transmission ratio as a function of angle. Our desired is this gray curve, or that might be what you would say is like the ideal curve. And we wanted to check, does our system actually provide that? And we did this analysis here and determined our actual transmission ratio, which is shown in blue. This should say transmission <coughs> ratio is also the slope of the input-output kinematics. Good? 
Last slide. We're talking about compound transmission. So I said that research example, it had three stages of transmissions. It had two stages of belt drives on one stage of a four bar linkage. That's called a compound transmission that's very common. In fact, the gear motors that we have are compound transmissions on our Plug 37D motors. So sometimes larger ratios are needed. This can be accomplished by stacking transmissions one after the other, known as a compound transmission. It's shown as gears here, but it could be any type. So we did four bars and belt drives. Ratios are multiplied. Efficiencies are multiplied. So it means, you know, this has a transmission ratio of 0.8, this is a transmission of 0.8. That starts to add up. We start to lose a lot of efficiency by stacking many transmission ratios, transmissions bind each other. But sometimes you need that. You just need that ratio to be high enough. Since they multiply, you could actually get pretty high ratios with a relatively low number of stages. But ratios are multiplied, efficiencies are multiplied. And this extends to an arbitrary number of stages. Yeah, this is just a little example of this. Input, output. We have a gear set, kind of one after the other. And then this kind of describes just for that little example what the transmission ratio and efficiency would be. So now you guys have seen information on gearing, screws, linkages, kind of general transmission layout information. What we're going to do next is to talk specifically about the layout of the ball bot. We're going to use that to derive its kinematics. So how motion of the motor transmits to motion of the ball. And then we're going to use that with your kinematics and also the, the torque production, how torque is distributed from the motors to the ball and from the kind of planar models of our ball bot to the, to the ball. And then we'll, uh, then we'll do mechatronics and then design and dynamics. I mean, control and dynamics. So that's kind of coming up. I feel like we're I feel like we're in a good place with this class in terms of our trajectory. I hopefully it hasn't been like too mismatched in terms of class content and lab content. We've been kind of working hard to keep that like at least like kind of close. Um, but that might not always be the case. We're not quite sure like how control will work. If you guys get to control before we get to control in class, I'll have to figure something out. But so far, I'm actually really happy with our pace and really happy with like what you guys have done in lab, all the progress we've made, and we'll kind of see how things go. Okay. All right, everybody, I'll post homework three. I have office hours today. Feel free to come by if you're working on your ball bots or get anything ready. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. <coughs>